5 bits are minimally edited videos that for one reason or another wouldn't work in my normal format. This one's on the Milwaukee Protocol, commonly believed to be the best hope against symptomatic rabies infection. A couple months ago, I made a video that got a bit of traction, but along with the influx of viewers came an influx of comments saying that I'd gotten something wrong. Rabies isn't 100% lethal, as I said in my video, but very, very close to it. Many commenters had attributed this discrepancy to the Milwaukee Protocol, a treatment plan for rabies after symptoms show. For those of you who haven't watched the video, dying from rabies is highly, highly preventable, given you immediately get a vaccine after exposure. Since the rabies virus is relatively slow to make it to the brain, getting a vaccine gives your immune system the tools to seek and destroy the infection. But once rabies hits the brain, there is very little that modern medicine can do except what's known as the Milwaukee Protocol. In 2004, a patient presented with all the classic symptoms of rabies and by all estimates was going to die. A doctor by the name Rodney Willoughby Jr. worked tirelessly with the CDC, analyzing all of the depressing fruitless rabies literature to cobble up a desperate plan to save their life. Even if the rabies vaccine does already exist, it would be an incredible achievement of modern medicine to essentially bring someone back from what most people would consider past the point of saving. A good chunk of the MP was not based on previous literature, but based on theoretical models of how scientists believed neurobiology and immunology worked. This, in my opinion, isn't as irresponsible as it seems, as much of the rabies literature before had only led to the same conclusion, that treatment at this point was not worth pursuing. Their overall strategy was to pump the patient full of antivirals. According to the literature at the time, this was not predicted to work as antivirals had not been shown to work in animal models, likely due to the blood-brain barrier preventing drug delivery. The team reasoned that it was still worth trying because with the patient's condition, their blood-brain barrier was likely compromised at this point. The rest of the care would focus on keeping her neurons from frying themselves through a phenomenon known as excitotoxicity. Damage to neurons can cause them to release calcium and other neurotransmitters that trigger nearby neurons to rapidly fire. This dumps more calcium and neurotransmitter into the area, causing more and more neurons to ramp up their firing. This elevated calcium signaling triggers cell death pathways. Ultimately, dead neurons dump all of their calcium into the area, propagating this positive feedback loop of neural disaster. In response, the team administered drugs that countered excitotoxicity and put them under a coma as a safety measure to really, really pump the brakes on neuron activity. Did I know about the Milwaukee Protocol? Yes. Yes, I did. And I purposefully chose to ignore it because, well, it made me kind of uncomfortable to talk about because this gets closer to the field of medicine and I'm not a health scientist or doctor. Not only that, but from the research that I could get, the perception that the Milwaukee Protocol was a miraculous Hail Mary in the face of the highest mortality rate virus to ever exist seemed to be fading. This is in stark contrast to public perception, and in cases where there are scientific opinions that differ from public belief, I would have preferred to keep the whole thing quiet. Although you'd be hard pressed to find anybody saying anything nice about the Milwaukee Protocol in the first couple pages of Google Scholar. That being said, what this patient went through was most likely hell and the team miraculously witnessed what was perhaps the world's first rabies survivor after symptoms showed, and nothing I'm about to say about the MP could take that away from them. But was this protocol really a miracle Hail Mary, or was this strategy merely correlated with other factors that may have made it easier to survive rabies? Think about it. The number of human rabies cases is low. The number of human rabies cases that progress to being symptomatic is even lower due to access to the vaccine, which remains the best and most reliable way to prevent rabies death. And since humanity has already developed the near-perfect counter to the rabies virus, the number of people that can have rabies treatments tested on them is staggeringly low. The patient survived, but not all patients do. In fact, the rate by which the MP was correlated with rabies survival is commonly reported to be 14% from at least 39 cases. A major contributing factor as to why people believe the MP protocol worked is that 14% seems a lot higher than 0%. Infinitely higher, even. But the rush of excitement over this massive accomplishment may have drowned out the potential importance of confounding variables. Let's go back to square one. What factors go into determining if the immune system overcomes an infection in an individual? An individual may have inherent biology that produces a sufficiently effective immune response. An individual may have been infected by a sufficiently ineffective pathogen. An individual may have received sufficient support to fight off an infection, or some combination of all of the above. If we take a look at cases where symptomatic rabies infected individuals survive infection, they are temporally correlated with the introduction of the Milwaukee Protocol. 
but the MP is also correlated with the idea that rabies can be treated, giving healthcare professionals reasons to try. And when healthcare professionals actually try, given their kit of modern medicine, it can be difficult to discern what parts of the trying actually helped. Was it actually the antivirals or the anti-excitatory protocol? The induced coma? Or was it that this patient had a whole team of doctors, nurses, and scientists trying desperately to keep their organs functioning long enough for their biology to fight off the infection? I don't know the answer for sure, but if the MP was really the miracle we believe it to be, then why does it come with an 86% failure rate, the inverse of its success rate? To me, as someone without qualifications mind you, it seems more fitting that a protocol that succeeds 14% of the time is not a protocol you want to advertise as your miracle cure. Was there something special about the patient then that allowed them to survive rabies? Were they rabies resistant? I have no idea and I couldn't find anything that suggested that they were. What I did find raises eyebrows as to the strength of the infection that they originally had. While, again, the amount of data that we have on rabies survival is minuscule, it is interesting to note that the majority of rabies symptomatic survivors were infected by bats and not dogs. Suggesting, again with low statistical power, that rabies strains in bats are not as vicious as rabies strains in canines. The last nail in the coffin for me personally was the fact that the majority of rabies virus survivors also did have previous exposure to the rabies vaccine, meaning for the majority of rabies survivors it's not possible to decouple the lingering effects of a previous rabies vaccine with the aggressive treatment that they got after developing symptoms. Are you still convinced that the MP is still worth keeping around? You could argue that having something with infinitesimally small chances of working is better than having nothing, but let's do some cost benefit and analysis. What are we losing by keeping the MP around? 1. Momentum The more people and doctors are convinced that the MP is a miracle, the less research will go into looking for new and innovative ways to treat symptomatic rabies. 2. Quality of life care It's sad to say, but the family of the patient has to make the call to undergo this aggressive treatment that will likely fail if the patient themselves is unable to. If the family believes in this miracle shot, they may choose to go with a desperate and hellish path rather than palliative care, which will allow the patient to live their last days with more of their faculties intact. Why was the public allowed to believe in the MP for so long? My guess is because it's a good story. While the vaccine had been a huge step for eliminating rabies, without complete eradication of the disease, it would always exist in the backs of people's minds, a horrible evil that would never be vanquished. But the MP gave people hope in the face of this biological cruelty, that human innovation could prevail. It's a good story, and good stories have a way of sticking around. This is why I felt like I couldn't tell this story in my 8 minute rabies video. Survival from rabies infection is complicated, and I thought it was better to just sweep it under the rug because I was afraid of screwing it up. If there's anything I would like for you to take away from this 5 bit, it's that the Milwaukee Protocol might, might, might not be the miracle that you think it is. That there is some compelling evidence out there that supportive care that patients got, as well as their luck in potentially encountering a weakened strain of rabies, may have been instrumental to their survival. The MP doctors witnessed a miracle. They made that miracle happen. I could never take that away from them. But how they made that miracle happen, from what I could find in the literature, isn't exactly clear. Perhaps one day the MP will be refined to the point where we can confidently call it a miracle. I sure hope that it will be. But yeah, I was totally wrong to say in my script that rabies is 100% fatal. I tried walking it back into the thumbnail, but I was still called out for it. And you know what? That's fair. 